When I was a kid, I was about 13 years old, music saved my life. I became a guitar player, I had been a saxophone player, I was sort of a restless, weird kid. I learned how to play the guitar and I got into a band. And everybody I knew wanted a Ned Steinberger guitar. And it's a real privilege and honor for me this week, this evening, to welcome Ned Steinberger, who's a resident of Nobleboro, to come and talk with us about the work he's done to revolutionize the instrument. And I'm just really grateful that, that he's here with us tonight. So, Ned Steinberger. <laughs> Uh, was, was a guitar maker and he 
was struggling with some demands that were being made on him by uh, his, uh, the dealers he was working with. And I ended up volunteering to do some design work, just speculatively, for Stuart, uh, which led me into this field, which I just um, had an immediate, uh, uh, a tremendous attraction to the idea of making musical instruments. After all, I couldn't make music on my own, but I could be, I could do something to support music. And uh, for me, musical instruments are kind of, you know, you have some bombs on this extreme, and you have musical instruments on the other extreme, and I definitely am uh, more inclined towards uh, making tools for artists than the weapons of war. Um, and um, it became a career. The, the real um, key moment for me in, in, in this uh, move towards a lifetime career was uh, developing this instrument here, which uh, is um, you know, very different from a traditional, this is a bass guitar, uh, but what I discovered uh, working for Stuart, uh, I should stay here, okay. What I discovered uh, working with Stuart was that um, bass guitars have um, balance issues because they have a, a relatively small body, a long neck, and heavy tuning machines on the end. The traditional bass has tuning machines at the end of the neck. And that was creating uh, what bass players are used to, is a neck dive, it's, a, it's not um, a, um, it, it just, uh, it, I should back up a little bit. When the furniture design that I did was focused primarily around seating. The reason I was involved in seating was I, the, the technical challenge, the, the challenge of making the chair comfortable as well as attractive, um, learning about the ergonomics involved in that, that was all you know, something that I was very heavily involved in with the furniture. But So when I got involved with musical instruments, uh, and, I, and at, that, at the beginning I knew very little, bit, uh, very little about how sound is generated from the instrument, over all the different impacts of different materials and structures and so on, how that affects the tone, pickups, and, and all of that. Were, were new to me, I really had no experience with that, but what I did connect with was the fact that the instrument has to fit the body, it has to be comfortable. My feeling was that uh, an ideal musical instrument is, is um, the player should be uh, unaware that uh, it's not part of his or her own body, it should be exceedingly comfortable so that uh, the artist can just focus on making music, not dealing with a backache or any other impediment to, uh, to their expression. So uh, I didn't like the idea that this, this neck was, was tilting down. I said, how could I deal with that? And I tried all kinds of things. I put little weights in the other end of the body and so on. But um, at one point, it, it occurred to me that, gee, that these tuners did not have to be out here. There was no particular reason why they have to be out there. Those tune, that tuning hardware could be on the body and all that weight could work for uh, an ideal balance as opposed to preventing the instrument from balancing well. So uh, it was, um, it took me quite a while actually to transfer that kind of concept into a, a viable reality. But once I saw that it was working, I, that's what really drew me into this whole lifetime career making musical instruments because I felt that there was something of real value there that, I, that was worth pursuing uh, that, um, and I could see with musicians too, I made, you know, I made, made early prototypes and one of the things that made it possible for me to do this was that I was able to, to make my own prototypes um, at a very low budget, I had, didn't have a lot of money but um, I had a little bit of time and I had a lot of energy and determination to try to make this concept uh, really work. And um, that's what led to the Steinberger Sound Company that I established in 1980. We had uh, a, a really fun run with the instruments for quite a few years. When I say fun, I guess that's... Uh, uh, <coughs> 
it doesn't. It was also very difficult uh, to, you know, I was just a, a very young man, and I had no experience as a businessman or anything like that, and you know, made every mistake in the book. Uh, but we managed to survive, and um, actually, the story there is that eventually, this we, we started out making these bases, and then we made the guitars. Steinberger guitars, but it's a similar configuration. Um, but the uh, the pressures of the business, financial pressures, and, and so on. I was I took the opportunity in, in 1987 to sell the Steinberger Sound Company to the Gibson Guitar Company, and then um, and actually at that point I was I was planning to make a career out of uh, working for Gibson, but. Uh, I found that uh, it was difficult enough working for myself, but working for someone else was more difficult. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, uh, I jumped ship and I, I got started on making these. Um, uh, well, geez, we don't have any violins here at all, uh, and the bass, the upright bass, is sitting there at an angle that's very hard to see it. But I started out making these these uh, bass, double basses. Um, which were uh, very different from uh, the instruments I had been making because they're bowed instruments. Uh, and in fact, even this, this instrument is, is different too. Uh, uh, what was interesting about this instrument, actually, if I may say, is that when I first got realized I wanted to make upright electric basses, and the, the, the thing that's really special about a, an upright electric bass is it has much longer strings than a bass guitar. And, you know, some of you may play piano or enjoy piano music. A grand piano is a huge instrument. You know, the, the long string is 13 feet long. The reason for that is that if you want to get a really clear, bright tone from a string, the longer it is, a, 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 a bass string, then Length is really important for that. That's why the grand piano is so huge. And these longer strings on a double bass give a lot of opportunity to create new, exciting sounds that uh, are not actually possible on a, on a bass guitar with this, this string length, which is shorter. Uh, but when I first started to make the upright, I decided I was going to make it headless. Why would I make it headless? Well, uh, what's interesting there for, for me to think about is I fell into the same trap that I tended to um, uh, see others falling into. You know, it's always easy to see somebody else's failings more than your own. So, um, my thing was, um, and you know, if you have an acoustic instrument, just, you can't really just put the tuning hardware on the back end, just can't screw it on. It would, kill the tone. You know, an acoustic instrument has a very thin, light top and uh, it has to be very free to vibrate. You can't just bolt some heavy tuning machine onto it and expect it to sound any good at all. So, when I got started on the, uh, when I started doing the electric and I discovered the headless uh, uh, approach, to the, by the way, I did not invent the headless guitar uh, or a headless instrument. In fact, I was just down at the uh, Museum of Fine Art in Boston. I have a Rickenbacker violin from 1933 or something like that, which is a headless violin. So, but I didn't know about that when I was dealing with, with uh, I mean, that's a very rare instrument. Also, it turns out that Les Paul made a headless guitar uh, long before I got into this game. I, I, I actually went to meet Les to uh, see his a headless guitar, because a friend of mine was uh, had a, he was in New York and I was in New York, but uh, he had such a house full of his inventions, junk all over the place that uh, he couldn't find it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, um, but anyway, so I go to make a, an upright bass and I said, well, I, you know, make it headless, but it, it took me a while to realize that this this headless configuration that had so much value, real value for uh, a bass guitar, not just, you know, to be different or to uh, be novel, but rather really had this essential uh, benefit. 
But, so, but on an upright base doesn't have that balance issue. It, in fact, it's more convenient to tune at the top of the neck than it is down at the bottom. So, uh, for me anyway, that was a lesson in, you know, not only thinking out of the box, but thinking out of your own little box, you know, and, and uh, so it's, uh, it was a, a learning experience for me. But anyway, I wanted to discuss this a little bit because this is what really brought me into this business. And, um, you know, we, uh, we had quite a bit of success with these instruments. Another thing that's interesting about this that uh, I might share with you just from my own experience is that, you know, these instruments are very different, of course, than a conventional bass guitar. And for me, they're different for the, the, the performance values, the functional values that are, uh, that are part of that difference in, in the style of the instrument. But, and when we had, uh, you know, in the early 80s, we had a lot of people playing these instruments, famous rock stars and so on. And an associate of mine who I worked with was older than I am, much older, who is, as you can imagine, no longer with us, since I've, I've caught up with him finally. Uh, but uh, he told me that I should understand that um, the guitar business is, a, is a, like a perfume business. It's all about fashion. It isn't about functionality. And I oh, that's ridiculous. And the reason that people are playing these basses and guitars is because they work so great. You know, but um, I learned over the years that he was absolutely right. Because, and the way I learned that is that it, it was a day when these instruments were in fashion. And that day came and went. The instrument is the same. The functionality is the same. It's not that somebody came in with something that was more highly functional. It's just that they were in style and out of style. And, so on musical instruments, the way they look, and the way the, the vibe that they have, and so on, is is absolutely critical to any kind of commercial success that you might want to have. So, um, any questions? Yes. Do you think in any way that it was harder to like evolve your guitar making because you were so successful with that design? Where, where you know what I mean? Um, not, uh, I don't feel that way about it because, you know, if you're, let's say you're the Gibson company, okay, with a long tradition of a certain kind of instrument or a Fender company, and I realize that some of you may not be so familiar with, with all, you know, these different uh, brands and what they look like in their history, but, uh, you know, these are very iconic brands, and it's very difficult for them to make a change. You know, one of the things that, um, about the guitar business, particularly the electric guitar business, is that you know electric guitars really be, uh, were became commercial with Leo Fender in, the, in roughly around 1950. And um, when I got first involved with with electric string instruments, it was uh, 1975. That was just 25 years later, and those instruments were uh, you know the leading instruments in the field, but um, there was, it, this was still kind of the tail end, I think, the, the early 80s was the tail end of the period of, of um, the pioneering period of, of electric string instruments. These instruments came from out of nowhere and, you know, the guy gets an electric guitar, he plugs it into a really cheap amp, and the amp, of course, is, is not capable of reproducing the sound of the string at all. It's just all distorted. And uh, the next thing you know, people are going, wow, that is a cool sound. And it was brand new, brand new sound. Uh, and so it led to an enormous, uh, you know, it led to rock and roll and all this great music that we have. And tremendous period of experimentation and development, essentially, you know, the time that uh, all these guys were pioneers, but as I see it, you know, things have changed in the guitar world um, tremendously since then. Those, those guys basically, uh, they settled the land to a large extent. They discovered the new things that you could do with an electric guitar. They made all kinds of new music that was not possible before. Nowadays, what is a guy supposed to do? Because 
That's all been done. And it isn't to mean that there's nothing left to be done in the exploration of electric string instruments, but the real heyday, uh, the time when it was just so vital and so exciting and so new, those days are over. And, uh, you know, the, the, it's reflected in the sales of electric guitars are actually down. I mean, they went up, 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 up for so many years, but they're on the way down. I don't, they're not going anywhere permanently, but it's a different world. Yes, ma'am? Can you show us how that tuning mechanism actually works? Because where did the strings go? Okay. Uh, very, I can explain that very quickly. Uh, in, inside here, this, this little box, it just a screw, it's as simple as you can get. There's a screw, there's a, there's a little kind of a slider, a little block, it's got a threaded, it's threaded. There's a screw attached to this knob and you turn the knob and it pulls the slider back and forth and it tunes the string. It's so extremely you, simple. you put the string in through the top? This one has double ball and strings. Um, and, so uh, it comes can, in from the top and it's secured at the top, at the nut. And then it goes down to the bridge and then into the guitar through the Correct. bottom and then it's like... Well, no, it just goes right up. Maybe I'll just take a second. I'll just take a string off. I'm sorry to put it down. I just loosen this knob. And uh, sorry, <laughs> just loosen this knob here. And this is what's really, really cool is it's so quick to change strings. Okay. That string is... You know, this removal. So the strings manufactured specifically for Steinbergers. These file. these are double ball head strings, which are manufactured specifically, which is a uh, uh, they work great. They're incredibly stable to me. I mean, unbelievable. You tune this, and this guitar is made out of carbon fiber. Okay, this is not made out of wood. This is very high tech uh, structure, which is extremely rigid, and. Um, Stable through oh, oh, temperature and humidity variation, so it's you know it's very um, it's not susceptible to the, in any kind of environmental um, yeah. changes. Is the body, the body weight like relatively light compared to like a fender bass? Well, it is a great great question because <laughs> when I started out, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I'm to to here. when I started out. Uh, I had this idea for this headless instrument. I was going to make it super light, and somehow it was all going to be great. It was going to have a great sound, um, and it was a complete disaster. It, it sounded terrible, um, and uh, it, you know, it's very keeping consistent. Having an instrument that is fairly consistent from fret to fret, string to string, is important. This instrument, one note would, would sing out, the two notes later it would just be dead as a doornail, completely inconsistent. Um, and I, I was really stressed because I put a lot of work into this thing and it was such a failure. Um, but after a while I got to thinking about it, I know, why is that? Well, how did I get it so wrong? And it's certainly, uh, for me, uh, and there's a lot of talk these days about being not being afraid to make mistakes, and everybody makes mistakes, and you can't get anywhere if you're not willing to make a mistake, which uh, I, I believe that that's true, because when you make a mistake, and when you understand how, you know, what happened, why you made that mistake, you, you begin to learn things on a level that is very hard to learn out of a book, in my opinion. If you do from personal experience, you know, if you, take your bicycle and you go around and turn too fast and slip out and scrape your knee, that's different from reading in a book that you should, you know, uh, be careful on your bicycle. Uh, so, uh, I learned, you know, that I had done it co the complete backwards way. What you want to do, instead of making a lightweight, flexible instrument, what you want to do is make something ultra rigid and the more it weighs, the better as far as tone goes. Of course, there's only so much you can put around your shoulder. So anyway, this baby is much heavier than it looks. And I think I took it too far. I, I have ideas for future projects that are related to this bass, and I'm keeping the weight down to a more, uh, a different compromise. Any musical instrument, pretty much any 
object that you make is going to be a compromise, you know, the chair you're sitting in, the room we're in, the lighting, you know, everything is, it, you trade off one thing against another and try to come up with the best compromise. So, uh, anyway, uh, that's how it tunes, okay? <laughs> Yes. Um, I heard you speak elsewhere when you designed the electric violin and the electric cello. You wanted it to be more than just a loud violin or a loud cello because there's more to an electric guitar than just a loud acoustic. And so my question, all that long-winded, my question is, can you point out any artists on the electric cello or the electric violin who are doing exactly that, doing stuff on, on the electric that isn't really done on the acoustic? Well, um, certainly there, there are all kinds of people doing things on the electric you couldn't do on an acoustic. I'm not so great at coming up with their names on the spot. Tony Well, uh, but... The with the yes. the cello on stage and dances around, you're not going to do that with an acoustic. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. Um, there's the sonic aspect, and there's also the performance aspect. Both are really important. And one of the key um, uh, tenets or whatever that I apply to my work with electric instruments is to try to understand how an electric instrument can um, be or just to explore everything an electric instrument can be and try to optimize what it can be as opposed to an acoustic instrument. For example, you're a cellist um, and you play an NS cello and you know that you have access all the way up the neck in a way that it, uh, and I brought this, this along here is actually uh, sort of like a cello uh, so you can see what our cello kind of looks like except that I brought this instrument, I thought we might have a a finished cello here to compare it to, but the point is that this is where I started. This is just a piece of uh, two by four, basically, cheap lumber that um, I fashioned into a model of what I was working on for a cello. This was never intended to be a musical instrument. This is a Maybe like an artist making a sketch of a painting or whatever, some, you know, a way to explore the possibilities with the maximum amount of freedom. Because, uh, you know, if I started out by making, you know, uh, getting some beautiful special uh, woods and carving them up and so on, if I get down the road on that and I realize I kind of wish I had made it a little bigger or a little longer or a little, you know, really can't do it anymore because you're um, making, you know, you, you're, you've invested all this in making the final product. So I stay away from making a final product until I've explored as much as possible all the different options that I would have and, you know, finally arrive at what I feel is the best that I can do. I'm going to show you something on that. Uh, the This body here, you may, you may notice a similarity between these two bodies here, okay? And I'm sure you can see what I'm getting at. This body is just made out of cheap uh, materials um, that I could be very free with. Uh, and I had a, a neck too, I don't know what happened to the neck, I was looking for that, maybe I use it for firewood, I don't know. But, <laughs> He has this lighter uh, rim around his body here. That's because I decided that the body wasn't big enough. So I got some, you know, um, body putty and I made it bigger. And I made it the size I wanted it to be. So by the time I went to make, and this of course is further down the line, uh, you know, this is not the next one I made, but the, the point is that I used, and you know, I had all my, my drawings over in the computer or whatever. 
and so then I can go back and, and uh, document the shape so I know how to, what that shape is. And you can see in the back here too, a lot of cross lines going back and forth. That's because this body was digitized. Nowadays, you know, computers have had a huge impact on our on uh, musical instrument fabrication and really uh, stepped it up too. I mean, it's it's great that uh, there's a tradition of handmade instruments and you know to make a fine acoustic instrument there's only so far you can go with a computerized uh, system but electric instruments are a bit different um, you can you know the key things on electric instruments are the alignment of the parts and the perfection of the neck and uh, that sort of thing and with these computer controlled machining centers you could just do um, unbelievably good work and for not much money so you could buy it now today you can get a, a guitar for a couple of hundred bucks electric guitar that's amazingly good when I started out over 40 years ago you couldn't get you know a, a good quality cheap guitar like that they were just kind of junk so technology has really improved a factory made guitar is a great deal so what's also interesting about this and this this is an NS electric guitar that this is um, you know I, I mentioned that I sold my company original Steinberger sound company to Gibson and then eventually started uh, NS design company and we made uh, mostly bowed electric instruments but we got into some guitars not so many years ago but this this instrument here this was the first time that I never made a handmade prototype I made the model the mock-up digitized it, and then had it machined for me on someone who has the machining center. Got it back and uh, I assembled it like um, an erector set. It was, it was a fantastic experience. More precise than I ever could have done it on my own. So the technology of making instruments and designing instruments has changed a great deal over this last, over my career. So anyway, I just brought this along to emphasize that, um, you know, if you're interested in developing something new, you can't just snap your fingers and have it right away. You've, you've got to kind of work on it, find your way to, to build the idea and uh, perfect the idea, optimize the idea. Um, because there's a lot of competition out there and um, you really got to come up with something um, that, uh, in my case, you know, I've always felt that if I don't do my absolute best, then um, I'm not going to do that well, you know, I, I, it's, I, so, yes? So, do you work with musicians brainstorming, like, acoustic instrumentalists or whatever to come up with ideas on how to innovate your next... Not so much, not so much. Um, it's more about having an idea, you know, musicians are great at making music, okay, but uh, they don't necessarily understand their instruments that well or understand what the possibilities might be. That's my job. So it's more about imagining what you could do to uh, make something of value to a musician. Putting it into some kind of form that, it, uh, that the musician can relate to and respond to. And they might say, you know, I don't think so. Uh, and of course you'll get different response from, from different musicians. It's not like every musician is, is going to have the same thing to tell you. And also, I had some experiences in my career where I got advice from high-level musicians that I took much too much to heart because you could be a great musician uh, and not really understand your instrument that well. And also, you might be a great musician and have certain idiosyncrasies that are, that are important to you, you know, a certain string spacing and what have you. So then you go, oh, well, this has got to be the greatest thing. Then you do that, and and uh, people go, "What are you doing? You know, why why did you do that?" In, in the case, this this instrument here, this this Steinberger bass has a narrow string spacing, narrower than normal, and that was primarily because I don't know if you guys have, have heard of Stanley Clark, but uh, he's a fabulous bass player who was touring, you know, where I was living, and I went to visit him in his show, and I brought the bass in, and um, he said, well, this is pretty cool, but you know, you really should put the strings much closer together, it's much better. So, 
I did. What was else was I going to do? <laughs> and, um, I've, I've regretted that for many, many years. <laughs> so uh, it's just you know a lesson learned again. Um, uh, making mistakes and learning from your mistakes. But anyway, I wanted to, to uh, show how you get. You know, you can go from this to that, but you know, you take it step by step. It doesn't just get there right away. Um, you know, uh, I have no idea how much time I've taken so far or how much more I've got to go. Hmm? 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so, you know, you asked how that instrument tuned with the uh, uh, double ball and strings. But, I, I, again, I brought uh, experimental things and, you know, uh, uh, part of things that show the process of what I do. This instrument here, um, I made a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago. Um, and what I set out to do, if you remember earlier I said that the headless instruments for electric make sense nowadays because whereas traditional acoustic instruments, uh, are, uh, it would not be suitable to put the, the heavy uh, tuning machines on, on the vibrating top of the body. Uh, and so, um, really wasn't a logical thing to do in the distant past to make a headless instrument. Um, but on the other hand, there are advantages to headless because it's compact. So I got the idea, how about making a, a travel, acoustic travel guitar? You know, how could you do that? Um, and by the way, after this experiment, uh, I don't plan on making any more acoustic travel guitars. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, this one was a lot of fun. And I, 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 it's the strangest guitar I've ever made, and it may be the strangest guitar you've ever seen, I don't know. But uh, if you, first of all, you see how the strings actually pull up on the top? Normally, strings pull down on the top. But that's how they work. You know, they come over the bridge and pull down. The reason these strings, and there's holes in the, in the bridge there, and so the strings go through, and you, uh, the reason they pull up is because you need to have access to the knobs, and the knobs go through that way. But also, this tuner actually goes, there's a, this neck goes all the way, goes down a little bit, and all the way through, the tuner is connected to the neck, so that it's not connected to the top at all. This tuner never touches the top. Um, and, but the other thing that is really, really unusual about this is that this, this structure that goes from the neck through here also has a, a leg that goes down and contacts the back here. So the strings pull up on the top here, and the only thing that keeps this body from, from going forward is that there's a, a kind of a foot that comes down and pushes against the bridge that's inside of this sound back. Post. So the sound post? it's it's not like a sound post, really, because the sound post connects the top to the back. Whereas this top and back are not connected at all. And they vibrate independently. And, what, and it, I don't know if you can see where this is bulging out here and bulging out the back. You see there's a curve here and here. Well, these plates are flies of board when they're made. What the bulging you see there is the pulling of the string up here against the bridge that's inside the back of the body. And so when this vibrates, it's different than a conventional guitar because when this goes out here, it's, it's more like an accordion than it is like a conventional guitar. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's loud. Um, it's got a smaller body, so the bass response is somewhat limited. But uh, anyway, um, it's just, uh, a project that I enjoyed a lot and I thought I would share with you. Um, and, uh, but I sh one other thing I'll show you on this instrument that uh, is part of something I've been working on for quite a long time that started with like, our violins. But remember, we saw how this, these strings were changed and they have to have a special string? Okay. Well, this instrument is different in that, uh, let's see, 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 let's that's not All right, this All right, so if you want to change the strings on this guitar, um, Corey, I didn't have any strings laying around, so Corey was kind enough to give me some strings for this demonstration. 
situation, but you didn't tell me that you wrapped them all together that that was possible. <laughs> um, so I'm working at here. We'll get there eventually. Good um, luck. Take it too long, but I did want to show this. So directly. Uh, but things are changing now with the internet. Again, I, I can, I use a lot of video conferencing. You know, I, the instruments that we make are not made here in the U.S. They're not made in Maine. They're made in the Czech Republic and um, India. And um, 
uh, the amount of the way you can communicate with people these days is, is, is unbelievable. I can, you know, the drawings are all digital. They have them, you know, ten seconds later and wherever in the world they might be, and so there are a lot of possibilities now that we wouldn't have in the past. And I think I'm, I probably have already overstayed my welcome. Uh, so if anybody has any last questions or whatever, I'd be happy to take a stab at it. Um, how are we doing, Nato? We, we're, we're pretty much uh, out of time, right? We're good enough. Okay. Anybody, any, any last questions for now? Yes, please. I'm from New York City, too, so I understand what you mean. Yes, sure. that, um, The thing that fascinates me, just to kind of bring it all together, is I remember when that headless, I, I, I'm a head of the so I remember when Getty Lee from Raj took the stage in one of those first things, and that was such a huge one. Whoa, what is that? You know, that he's playing. And then it kind of fizzled out from there, and we all thought it would be the, kind of like the second comment, like this is what it's going to look like. How do you, and you mentioned that it ends up being almost like a fashion thing. Yes. And, and I know I can't say how would you predict, because then we all ask these a lot of ticket numbers. But how, do you, how are you able to marry that design in, in your head of what might be coming in the forefront of music so you can keep that business going in innovative design? Well, um, I certainly, uh, did not have fashion in mind when I designed it. I was, you know, really, the, the, the way this design evolved was that I had the headless idea, but you, you can't just take a conventional base, well, that's where we started with the base, and just chop the head off. Uh, you've got to come up with an aesthetic totality, something, you know, integrity is extremely important in any design. It, it has to be true to itself, you have to have something you're trying to accomplish. If you don't, if you don't have a direction, it, it, you, you can't get anywhere. You have to know some idea where you want to go or what you're trying to accomplish and then stick with it. So um, this instrument was all about finding a way to realize a headless idea that would, would have its own identity. It would not just be a freak, you know, if you... Uh, and it's tough because with the instruments we make now, we have a family of instruments. Some members of the family have heads, and other members of the family don't. <laughs> uh, that's, that was an aesthetic challenge, actually, to, to marry that together in a coherent way so that they seem like they uh, are part of a family. I actually have one last sure. uh, question. So I'm Nate Swag. And one of the things we've been talking about lately, he goes to these urban renewal conferences, or they're not, it's not really urban, I'm not supposed to say revitalization. revitalization. Um, how to build community in small towns, how to bring people back together, get them out of the internet, you know, the whole bowling alone thing, how to bring them back together. And I think at one of the conferences he came back and we started talking about aesthetics. We, you know, he, there's this very famous architect who said if we actually had aesthetic education, and I'm a poet, so I teach poetry. Um, if we actually studied beauty in design and art, we wouldn't have these hideous buildings that we have like all over the United States. We wouldn't really have, I'm exaggerating, but we wouldn't have like Best Buy and then, you know, Target and then Walmart. And the sort of lack of, you know, usable space for humans. And it's, you know, because there's a relationship between what spaces look like and what how humans interact with one another, and aesthetics. And so one of our big things that we believe in is just the study of beauty, which is sort of out of fashion. And I can teach it in my classes. I can say, that, you know, what makes this poem beautiful? Clearly you're talking about design. I like what you're saying about things being practical, but also sort of innovative and beautiful. But do you have thoughts about aesthetics as a putting, any kind of ideas about putting aesthetics back in the middle of the American endeavor? Well, uh, you know, um, that's a that's a tall question. <laughs> but a lot of people, you know, people have different ideas about what is beautiful or not beautiful. It's it is ultimately in the eye of the beholder. Some people responded positively to these minimal rectangular little instruments without proper headstock and so on, but a lot of people hate them. 
Uh, there, I, I mean, I've, I've talked to you know uh, guitarists and bassists who are really deeply offended by it. I mean, they're, they're not mean to me, but they, it's like, you know, what, what were you thinking? I mean, and, uh, you know, uh, innovation is, um, in the music business, is, is tough because music is, uh, musical instruments are generally, um, you know, the consumer is interested in the tradition and interested in what went before. They're interested in what they're, what, you know, if you're interested in, in um, Renaissance music, you want it to be played on a, on a Renaissance cello. If, and this is sort of, took me a while to really figure this out, but, you know, if you're into Eric Clapton, you're going to want to play, you know, a Fender Strat. Um, you're not going to want some other thing that some guy who doesn't even know how to play music invented and, uh, so, I think that um, I'm not so quick personally to say, you know, this is beautiful, this is not beautiful. Um, but it's more about, I think, having the freedom of expression uh, and hopefully having some kind of open minded audience that can appreciate what you're doing. Um, but, you, you know, you've uh, you got to stick with it, of course, and uh, find compromises too. <laughs> Um, between what you might imagine would be very special and exciting and with what you realize that the public at large is really prepared to accept. Uh, so a lot of what's... When I started making the, you know, the, the story behind this instrument, really, it's kind of a crazy story, but when I was uh, 25 years old or whenever it was, I was working on that Star Wars had just come out. And they have this scene where uh, it's like a space bar in the, in the year, you know, 3000 or whatever. Uh, and all these weird guys, you know, from all different planets and all kinds of weird, you know, high tech uh, robots running around and everything. And they walk out on stage with fenders. <laughs> and I'm going, oh my God, you know, how could that? How could that happen? And uh, so, and you know, this, this, so this, this was more my idea of what a, a space age base would be like. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and what's really ironic about that is that this is now considered retro. <laughs> and, uh, which does not make me happy. <laughs> Just talking about this idea of the instrument in tradition, and then this idea about innovation and being willing to be brave and create and do things that for other people don't make sense, like putting a big metal bridge on an acoustic guitar and making it work. That's something that I think Maine does a lot, does well. And so I'm, I'm really proud of that. I'm glad Ned's a, found his way to Maine to be a part of this community. Yeah. 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 I want to thank uh, NS Designs for donating uh, a really fabulous bass guitar for our Ian Parker Foundation fundraiser. The money for that goes to supporting local music and local musicians and to keeping that uh, energy and enthusiasm alive for that. It was very gracious of them uh, to donate an instrument for that. I hope that all of you walk out of here with a raffle ticket tonight. But uh, let's thank Ned one more time. For us. <laughs> If I understand right, uh, Adam is going to come on stage and, and demonstrate one of Ned's instruments for us and then we'll uh, segue into the band starting.